Good morning and welcome to day two of Meet the Disruptors, two days of free online events exploring key market challenges brought to you by Ditto, the B2B tech marketing practice. Thank you for joining our panel discussion, Legerity, Meet the Team. Today, we'll look at the industry drivers that led to the founding of Legerity, the cutting edge tech solutions they provide for financial transformation and the problems they are solving for their clients. But first, some introductions. I'm Mike Wilson, I'm CEO and founder of Ditto, and I have the pleasure of moderating today's session. And I'm joined this morning by Jeremy Wood, the CEO and founder of Legerity, and his colleagues, Mark Miller, head of client advisory, and Stuart Eaton, COO. Just a little on me with some introductions. I spent 30 year career working in sharp end of finance and tech in Asia, the US and Europe, but with Arbat, Winter Partners, UBS, Bankers Trust, and Deutsche Bank, founded Ditto in 2008, and we're an award-winning market communication and business practice dedicated to fintech and emerging technologies. And it's my pleasure now to hand over to my panelists to introduce yourself, and I'd like to start with Jeremy. Jeremy, if you can introduce yourself to our audience, please. So uh, many thanks, Mike, and, and thank you for the uh, invite to participate in the event. So my name's Jeremy Wood. I'm CEO and founder here at Legerity. Um, I started my career in IT back in 1985, so now well into my fourth decade, so seen a lot over that, that period of time. Um, I've had five startups, uh, all would have, which have, have generally focused on developing you know, new and innovative applications uh, to support finance and accounting. Uh, Legerity is my fifth and, and uh, proud to say my final startup. Uh, what we do at Legerity is provide a, a cutting edge third generation uh, cloud-based accounting rules platform that helps firms deliver accounting change and finance transformation. Lovely, thank you very much. Congratulations and Mark, uh, an introduction of yourself please. Yeah, thanks Mike. Yeah, hi everyone. I'm uh, Mark. I'm um, Head of Client Advisory at Legerity. So I'm an accountant, chartered accountant, trained, trained many years ago in PwC and financial services. And then since then I've been lucky enough to work all over the world in, in line roles for different companies and involved in a lot of transformational projects. So I spent a lot of my time trying to deliver business insight to senior management and working on projects uh, to try and enable that. So I know how, how difficult it is. And I was lucky enough three years ago to join Legerity and it's been great working with a platform that is so focused on that difficult task. Oh, fabulous, thank you very much, Mark. And Stuart, an introduction for yourself, please. Yes, thanks, Mike. Hi, good morning, everyone. Um, thank you for joining the webinar. Um, I'm a chartered accountant like Mark from New Zealand. Um, I've been in the or living in the UK for around 30 years now, um, working mainly in uh, large investment banks. I've done a number of different roles in those organisations, from chief operating officer, um, finance line roles, risk roles, um, and probably more latterly, a number of uh, change roles. Um, I joined Legerity last year uh, to help uh, drive the company forward, um, particularly with a focus on financial services. Wonderful. Well, thank you very much for it, uh, guys. It's a real pleasure to moderate today. I was thrilled with Jeremy as a serial, a serial entrepreneur, Mark, all these different line jobs globally, and then Stuart with a flavor from Invest Banking. It's a real pleasure bringing everyone together today. So thank you very much for your time. So uh, just a couple of notes to the audience. This webinar is being recorded, and you can enter any questions you have into the wee little chat go to webinar side panel there. And my colleague, Mike Richardson. Hello, Mike. Are you there? I am, yes. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> Mike is on the sliders and faders and he will take good care of us. Any questions you pop in, he will then um, do a quick wrap up at the end of the session. So we'll be stopping the session here around 10.40, 10.50, and at which point we're going to encourage everyone to come over to our digital hangout. So if you fire up a separate browser, digital.tv slash MTD, um, that's a really neat little platform where you can meet Jeremy and Mark and Stuart and we can hang out with the guys there and have a chat with them about all of the great insights we're going to share with you today. So let me just explain the format. So to start this morning, Jeremy is going to share the industry drivers that led to the beginnings of Legerity. And with four decades and a fourth decade now of technology entrepreneur and his fifth startup, I'm really looking forward to chatting that through with him. We'll then take a look under the hood, as it were, with the technology with Mark. We'll be discussing, um, uh, how, you know, banking becoming a platform which short and there's a huge trend from bricks and mortars to digital and how that's been accelerated with digital transformation. As I said, there'll be questions throughout the panel with the folk about some of the projects they've worked on and business benefits. Then we'll sum up a, uh, some audience Q&A, a closing comment each, and then we'll move into the digital hangout. So, um, um, 
Right. I think to begin with, then, I'm going to first turn to CEO and founder Jeremy Wood. And so, Jeremy, um, what industry drivers led to the founding of, of Legerity, please? And just chat us through here. You know, this is, as you say, your fourth or fifth startup. So give us the founding story. You'll be mm -hmm. quite to share with our audience. Sure. Very happy to do that, Mike. So, um, as I mentioned, sort of Legerity is the third generation of, of our accounting rules technology. So out of the five startups, three and have been in, in this space. So it's a space we know we know very well. Um, and you know, the reasons for doing it sort of, you know, go back for, for many, 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 many years. Uh, and sort of I'll, I'll just cover a little bit of, of the background and then why we did it again in, in Legerity. So our journey in this space started, sort of started 28 years ago and we developed a, a, a blueprint for what we called event-driven accounting. So this really was a systems architecture and for finance. And it was a sort of a next generation, albeit 28 years ago, uh, gener uh, type of architecture. The concept was based around a separation of accounting logic from all the disparate source systems, the trading systems, the settlement systems, but to put that accounting logic into a standardized accounting rules platform and subledger. And by adopting this, firms could move to a very consistent form at a very highly detailed granular level of accounting across all products and geographies. So rather than using the accounting functions that were sort of baked in and hard coded in their source systems, um, we standardized this. In those mm -hmm. days, our primary sector was investment banking, capital markets, and that was a sector highly regulated, High transaction volumes, complex accounting needs, you know, accounting for derivatives was quite complex. Hmm. And they required, the banks required this standardized PL across all lines of business, ideally by nine o'clock the next morning, both at a counterparty and a trade level and also on a multi gap basis. So it was quite a complex requirement. And the architecture worked well. So we developed technology around the blueprint. And it took us a few years to achieve it, but we ended up with many large global institutions like UBS, Deutsche, HSBC using using the solution. And these are the days of kind of batch processing, Jeremy, and kind of overnight batch runs and kind of oh, getting yeah. data ready the next morning. So this is this is really struggling with technology too. This isn't the days of everything being on demand. Yeah. Yeah. And they yeah. used to have, you know, red alerts that if you didn't yeah, get your yeah. P and L by nine o'clock, then screens. yeah, yeah, very good. You're always catching up. But if you roll a clock forward, sort of ten years or so, it became clear that there was a host of new complex accounting standards that were being now introduced across a wider number of industry sectors. And it was clear that if we took the concepts of what we had done previously, but put it on a, a modern platform, then we could use the same type of approach and blueprint for helping these, these other firms. And some of the standards that were coming through in accounting that were quite complex, things like IFRS 9 for financial instruments, IFRS 15, revenue recognition, and, and more recently, IFRS 17 for insurance contracts. So we saw that there was a gap in the market. No other firm had really taken, you know, this accounting rules technology idea forward and, and improved on what we had done before. So that was the opportunity for Legerity. So um, we developed this, you know, we use modern technology, cloud-based, open source, all those good things, and came up with this platform that could not only help firms deliver accounting change, in a fast and you know very efficient, cost-effective manner, but also be a cornerstone of a wider um, finance and digital transformation platform. So you know, it's fantastic. And as you say, you, you touched on on some great stuff there, which I know we'll explore later. We're marketing an open source, digital native. Yeah, and you're tackling extremely difficult problems. I know you prepared some thoughts on the next slide, uh, please, to, to share with our audience some of the complexity that's, that's driving this. You know, when we think about kind of um, uh, regulation as an abstract kind of idea, this is really important stuff and very difficult thing to solve. So maybe for for our audience, if we just explain what IFRS 17 is about, why it came about, why it's so important, both for us as consumers and for insurers. Yeah, sure. So I, IFRS 17 is a, a new, uh, a new. It's a pretty complex accounting standard. Um, it's one of these standards that doesn't just affect, affect finance, it also affects other stakeholders within the business, obviously senior management, but also actuarial and IT. So it sort of bridges a number of different disciplines, which always makes projects even more challenging when you have to cover 
you know, you have multiple stakeholders. It's a global standard that affects about 450 regulated firms globally, and it has to be delivered by 2023. Um, that may seem quite a long way away, so January 2023, but um, it's, it's probably the biggest back office change that certainly I've seen since I've been involved in IT. And, and so timelines are quite tight, even though 2023 seems a long way away. Hmm. Um, and, yeah. And and Tony, it, it, it you know as a a, a an insure tech, uh, eye catching uh, fintech um, uh, startup, um, working and in, working into the space with new technology. How has the new technology been? You know, it addresses core problems that bigger firms are having here because maybe we just explain about the ledger piece to it, how that can be adjuncted to their other books and records, and where kind of legitimacy fits in this in this in this puzzle, please, um, um, Jeremy. Yeah, so um, so I guess when, when we sort of look at how we've addressed IFRS 17, you know, we, we had a, a really good starting point in terms we'd already been working with other standards like IFRS 15, mm. and we could use the, the sort of breadth of our product in terms of the, the calculation engine to do some of the actuarial type calculations like discounting and those type of things. The accounting rules module is obviously a core thing for applying the new debit credit. Uh, standards to, to create the journals and then the ledger itself or the sub ledger provides us with this fantastic you know financial control around a very granular set of, of data and unlike your sort of books and records in the firm which are the the sort of the general ledger which is fairly sum or highly summarized and tends to be very historic within the sub ledger you can keep what we call very detailed segmentation so you are talking about, you know, up to policy level details, line of business, all this additional business insight that Mark was talking about, you know, that leads to not just delivering um, compliance, which is obviously, you know, the first thing you have to focus on, but also giving you this opportunity uh, to look at more transformational type benefits. Yeah, and I'd like to explore that for a minute with our audience, Jeremy, because it's a really eye-catching thing about how you solve that IFRS 17. And um, before we move on to the next, the, the first of my panel questions, but just you know, this competitive advantage um, of of you solving out this piece here, but because of the jersey's forward-looking with your architecture and cloud native and rules-based, it gives them a competitive. Because you may be just talking about turning a reg into a competitive advantage. What you mean by that? Yeah, so from 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 a competitive perspective, it's it's you have a number of different different things. You know, one of the one of the opportunities if you've got this modern platform like Legerity, highly scalable, highly power, you know, very powerful, ultra ultra um, ultra high performance, um, and sort of on demand processing, it gives you the opportunity to turn a compliance project, which is can can be seen as ticking the box to mm. this this really detailed set of, of, of accounting, validated, financially validated, um, really useful inf information. So one of, one of the, the sort of key sort of building blocks to that is the ability to actually account at contract level or policy level for IFRS 17. And what we have seen in other um, sectors like IFRS 15, where we did a very similar type thing in the telco sector, was that if you can not just see this as a tick in the box, but actually see it as an opportunity to get financial control and effectively, you know, profitability, all that type of stuff around individual customer contracts, then that really puts you in this, you know, fairly unique position that you've got, you know, this one version of the truth fully financially yeah. validated to drive better insight into contract profitability, you know, and all that type of projections going forward. Um, mm -hmm. We'll talk in our third session today, we talk about our case study with, with Bitter, um, which did this exactly for IFRS uh, 15, and it really started to drive, you know, transformational benefits, which other firms who do it at a higher level of accounting aren't able to do. No, lovely. And I would encourage, I know our audience is a mixture of IT and business, but there's a fantastic set of use cases about the changing role of the finance function with insurance. I would encourage everyone to look at on the Jersey's website. And they've some great um, websites and discussion panels. They actually done with PwC and KPMG and Deloitte. So I point everyone in that direction there. It turns me nicely, Jeremy, to the first panel question. Next slide, please. 
which is you now you, you've talked about this uh, you've talked about um um the great work you've been doing here but is there a particular client project success you'd like to highlight uh, our project successes and, and why yeah I guess everyone has has their sort of own own favourite projects, depending <laughs> on your your sort of level of involvement. So your sort of pet projects. I think like the better one. About, which is your favourite child? <laughs> yeah, I think I think and, and over the years I've had many many of those. Um, yes. <laughs> so uh, with with Bitter, I think that was that really was so Bitter Group. You, know, you can yeah. you can get all the details on on our website. Um, but this this you know they really pushed. They, one, they play in this digital world anyway. You know, they're a major provider of mobile connectivity, all around data, all that sort of stuff. But they really, out of all of the firms that implemented IFRS 15, I think they had the most advantageous one really going down to this contract level. And it really has given them a lot more business insight. I think the other thing that was a really good sort of testament on that program was you know we delivered in very rapid time scales on budget and that really was um, a testament to our, our sort of pre-configuration so when we go to market for a particular use case we don't turn up with an empty box it's all about um, pre-configuration and uh, giving the clients a, a good starting point so that's IFRS 15 the other one I think that was pretty fundamental for the firm was really our, our first IFRS 17 project that was with a, a global insurer and uh, again we never tend to start small at Legerity this is multiple <laughs> geographies in different places um, and and the exciting thing there was that this really was a forward-looking or is a forward-looking firm they have great plans around their digital data ecosystem it's all cloud on AWS um, and and that started 2000 um, 2019 and uh, we've got to the stage where we're at um, advanced stages of the project around testing and, and moving into transition. So again, you know, fantastic, uh, fantastic project, fantastic delivery, and you know, very supportive clients. So uh, that's 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 probably for the firm the other highlight. Super, thank you. So all that will be in the show notes, folks, and we'll follow up later. But um, yeah, so look, contract level data, but better pre-configure, quick deployment. IFRS 17, a global insurer. I know that Jerry's very proud of the work you've been doing in Asia and in the US too, so all hats to them. So Jerry, before I leave you and move on to the panel, just looking forward now, we've just, what is the Jerry's mission and plans for the future? Yeah, just share with us a, a little a little moment on that before we move on yeah. to Mark. Okay, well, just a, a sort of quick, quick run through on that. So, you know, we just finished uh, recently our sort of fifth year of, of, of our, our first phase of our business plan. And, um, you know, I think, you know, it's always a good time to sort of step back and say, did you achieve what you set out to? I think largely that we have, um, you know, we, we, we've we developed the product, it's live in, in, in production, successful implementations. We have very high ratings for customer, uh, customer satisfaction and we compete against multi-billion dollar firms on a regular basis and win. And a lot of that actually was recognized by Chartist recently where we were positioned as one of the market leaders uh, in their recent quadrant on subledger and accounting rules technology, which was nice, nice to see. If we look over the 2020s, you know, again, having done this for, for a few decades now, I'm equally as excited. The 2020s will be a decade for digital finance transformation and we're going to be at the forefront of that. So, you know, uh, firms now, I think their journey around wall-to-wall -wall ERP implementations is, is now legacy. I think they want agile, powerful rules-based applications that are available on demand, can be implemented 30, 60, 90 di type day applications, um, and can fit into their existing legacy or modern infrastructure in a seamless, seamless manner. So we got a blueprint, you know, we started out with the blueprint 28 years ago. We got a blueprint now, which is called Finance 2030. It's transformational, it'll help firms deliver the finance department of the future. Oh, wonderful. And, you know, congratulations, Jeremy. You're an absolute gentleman. And it's a credit to you and, and, and everyone at Jersey. And a real, you know what, a real GBPLC success story. So all fair play to you. It's absolutely super. That leads us nicely to, to turn to Mark now and actually look under the hood a little bit and talk about the tech. So, so um, Mark, just give us a, a drive through on the tech behind the Jersey. Maybe talk us through the way the fast post platform on which it's built is acting, how, why it's so dynamic. Now, I know you've got some great slides for various here. We've got this slide here. Then we've got some other visual slides. 
quick drive by on fast post, why the platform was built and why is it so dynamic? Yeah, thanks, Mark. So I think when we were building the fast phone, fast post platform, we had to develop an architecture that could support multiple business use cases. We've already talked about RFS 15, RFS 17. So, you know, you, you can build a, an application that can do a very specific job, but really what you want to think of is the wider, wider picture and how you can architect that to support multiple business use cases. So what we were thinking about is, you know, in traditional batch type processes, you get high volumes through at the end of the period, be it a day, week, month, and, and you basically have a short window to process them, so very limiting. In a more modern sort of real-time or, or near real-time architecture, you need to process things immediately. So you need a very low latency in the end-to-end -end processing. An example, as Jeremy mentioned, could be in a banking sector where you need daily or intraday P&L. You know, now we're working in the insurance space, you know, where you require real-time month-end adjustments based on high volumes of data. So new regulations, changes to IFRS and the evolution of digital in the, in the industry are now requiring much more granularity of data and more complex calculations. And, and not to mention, you know, there's demands of, of, of dynamic digital type, type products. So technically, this is a, a real challenge and not, not many vendors have, have been able to, to solve it. So we've built a highly scalable architecture that uses in-memory data grid technology. So this provides a platform that really lends itself to ultra fast on demand processing with a massive amount of scalability. So this allows the back office and finance to process much more quickly whatever is being uh, thrown at it. Mm. So this power allows us to process highly granular data as well as significantly reduce the processing aspect of the working day timetable. So you can do more uh, a lot quickly and this can reduce close periods, free up value, resources which can then be more focused on on value and business insight particularly when you then have a lot more data and information available yes, to help deliver that, that business and this insight. Contract, this contract level data indeed and I'm going to explore actually I'd like to turn to the next slide please Mark I'd like to kind of elaborate a little bit further on this you know when we talk about dynamic visual precision cloud native integrated could you just maybe explain to your audience you know this single version of the truth why is that important what's it all about yeah, I mean, I think back in many of my roles, you know, contract or product based client based accounting has long been the target of, of finance, but you know, the, the finance infrastructure just just can't really deliver it. Traditional finance systems have not had the capability within their inherent design or the processing power to be able to do that. So typically your accounting is performed at a highly aggregate or summarized level, your know, portfolio or biz business segments, and, and very much at the end of the month and, and looking sort of backwards. So what this means is that you then end up with a whole host of separate unattached systems, be they spreadsheets or BI databases uh, created further downstream or even sitting in different departments that uh, enable people to sort of break down the numbers that are finance are reporting. And of course, you know, that often lends to silos being built up. So commercial managers having their own data that they want to look at, that they want to manage. And that's kind of disconnected then from, from the finance system. So you lose a bit of control and you also lose an enormous amount of time and energy reconciling different points of view. So typically the CFO could be saying, you know, we're not doing very well on our revenues, whereas the commercial or product owners have been using different different data and they might have a, a contrasting point of view. And and this puts an enormous sort of wasted strain on the on the organization. So having an integrated view at a granular level with all those disciplines of finance alongside is a really powerful. And that's what we mean by one version of the truth. So different stakeholders in the business can be looking at information from different points of view, but of course it's all, all brought together. And this is where the regulation comes in because both IFRS 15 and 17 in particular have meant that you just cannot deliver the accounting unless mm. you bring in that contract level data. Well, indeed, and just just to, to re-emphasize, I know in our upcoming panel after this one, we're joined by by Calvin, who's head of enterprise at O2, and he's going to talk on that specific piece here. That at the back end, with granular accounting, that the more we can innovate at the back end accounting, the quicker we can innovate at the front end of a business like O2 and carriers to deploy new innovative products and market them out, out in, into the public. 
I want to ask, build on, on the point Jeremy made, um, uh, Mark, and just talk about, maybe just elaborate. We see this wonderful stuff here, ultra high speed, real time, batch processing, massive scalability. But on the bit music, as you talked about it being pre-configured, could you just maybe just elaborate on what the pre-configured element means here? Yeah, so pre-configured means um, we're not just coming with an empty box. So Legerity Fastpost is a platform. Uh, and it has a role of, of processing accounting type data and it has a whole range of functions that you would expect within a finance tool. So the sub ledger functionality, revaluations, balances, movements, journals, all these sorts of things come out of the box. And that's essentially what the application is. But it's then very different to set it up for particular use cases. And so you know, that's really what we mean by pre-configured. So when you think about something like IFRS 17 and the standard is hundreds of pages long, enormously uh, difficult to uh, interpret and understand, it's a very legalistic document. To translate that into what it means for a system and what kind of data calculations and postings and structures you need, that is actually difficult. So we don't see why everybody should have to reinvent that themselves so you know that's what we mean by pre-configured we come with the, that layer in our system where we've kind of set it up if you like for a, a specific and complex use case super well it brings you on nicely to the next slide here and it, it is definitely of the moment um you know everyone talks about the importance of cloud and you are great partners with aws well just maybe for our audience just explain you guys are cloud native know why that has been such a revelation for you deploying and servicing your customers yeah so i mean i think there there's a big difference between a company that is able to put their application on the cloud and one like ourselves that have been built up from the cloud on day one so you're working with a system that has been specifically designed to, to work seamlessly with the cloud and maximize all the uh, advances and investment that's going on in cloud technology. So, you know, I'm an accountant, so I see it, you know, you could just install your software on the cloud, but of course, you know, that's just in that box, if you like, whereas there's a lot more to the cloud than that. And there are many advances in security, data protection, on-demand computing, performance optimization, scalability, all these things. So, you know, company like AWS investing millions and billions of, of, of pounds into this infrastructure and unless you're an application that's set up and you know in your dna is designed to work on the cloud you're not going to be able to take advantage of that so we're not just looking now but we're looking at you know future proofing our investment and bringing value over the next you know 10 20 years as, as ourselves and the cloud evolves together so mm. You know, as we talked about, you can put a wrap around your application, put it on the cloud and say, there we are, I'm a cloud based mm -hmm. person. But that really limits you in performance, usability and can conflict on how new technologies interoperate uh, oh, with each look. other. You support and, and I'm delighted. And, and I'm delighted to say that as a follow up um, to everyone who's attending me to the sort of over two days, there's a wonderful white paper which uh, Legerity have co authored with Deutsche Bank, KX and Finos actually on cloud. So uh, stay tuned, folks. That will be popped into your inbox on Thursday morning as a follow-up to our uh, to our uh, industry event. So coming to the last slide in your section here, uh, Mark, I, I noticed some pieces. We I just touched on Finis there, but but just just you know, elaborate just what open source, the benefits of it, the work you're doing there. I know you champion this, um, and I think just a, a little bit of elaboration for that would always be super. And you're yeah, I, mean, I think open source, you know, fundamentally. Uh, is is great because you're you're able to take advantage of all of the investment that's going on all around the world in in different new technologies. We can't predict what these new technologies are, but being open source and compatible and able to integrate with these kind of developments is is a fantastic benefit. But you know, a lot of people raise concerns around security and the scrutiny that goes into the coding. Is it quality? But you know, if we think about the open source movement and the way it's it's uh, adopted inside applications, means you know this is a great asset for people who can use open source software, and we're not constrained by kind of legacy issues. But we you know we've seen that security is is not not such a problem now, and in fact, it's even better because the open source applications are being developed at such a pace, they're keeping keeping in pace with all the cloud technologies and the, the kind of threats that might happen on applications. So in a way, you know, open source is more secure than 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 uh, non-open source and the cost of ownership is is much less. And we can see, 
you know, or our application is able to take advantage of, of, of high class uh, applications like Postgres, Hazelcast in memory data grid and Apache Airflow. And these are technologies that have been used by some of the biggest, fastest growing firms in the world, yes. like Apple, PayPal and Airbnb. And yeah, and I think too, look, uh, the times we're living in, the, the unprecedented times we're living through at the moment, the acceleration of digital transformation, it's cloud native, open source are going to lead that way. It really, look, really fabulous uh, insights. Thank you very much. And look, as, as folks, everything will be in the show notes, some great use cases. And as I say, that that white paper will be popped out to you on Thursday. It brings me to my nicely to my second panel question. Next slide, please. So uh, I'm going to start the question with you, uh, Mark, and then I'm going to bring Stuart in. But you know, a particular client project or aspect of technology or challenge that was this, was difficult. There are any learnings to share? We all know working with technology isn't easy. I mean, Jeremy was just talking about back in the day with batch processing. So it's um, as a particular learnings you'd like to share with our audience, uh, Mark, and why? Yeah, thanks. Right. And I think it's something we've touched on a bit already is that, you know, you can have this great technology, you, everything can be super fast, great data models, great reporting capabilities. But at the end of the day, there are still business challenges that have to be defined. And, you know, no one's found an answer for that. So, mm. you know, the biggest challenge that I see is we go into our clients, right, what do you want? Well, that's a very difficult question for people to answer, especially when you've got, as Jeremy said, it, it, you know, accountants, actuaries, IT people, different stakeholders at different levels of knowledge. So one of the key learnings for successful projects that we've had is have a stick in the ground, have a pre-configuration, have frameworks, have models that, that show the client how everything fits together. So that doesn't mean the client can't you know, have whatever they want and do what they want, but it does mean you get the project off to a flying start and you have a very firm foundation with which to make make progress and it's all about getting out of the traps in the right foundation and base that's super i think i'd like to turn to stuart now with the same question sure do you have anything you'd like to share with us and add to this um yeah sure uh, mark i just sort of uh, adding on and enhancing from from mark i think it's great to have all the materials um prepared up front but mm -hmm. the key thing that that we've seen with a lot of our clients that that really makes projects go well is getting something tangible in front of them so so the the product and the system itself um, spending too long on design and too long in workshops um, you know tends to erode confidence a little bit so the sooner we can get the system stood up get some data in it and start seeing outputs that the client can um, you know see and feel it becomes tangible it becomes real and clients that that, that often tends to be the sort of point at which the project goes from you know stuttering along perhaps to to really going yeah. full speed. Mm. Super. Well, it, it actually leads me in nicely to to the next section of our of our, our our discussion today, which is banking becoming a platform. So next slide, please. Now I'm going to turn to stay with you, uh, CEO Stuart. Uh, you live in an extensive 25 year you're a veteran in the financial sector, and this is a really interesting development too for an exciting two development for the Jersey where traction was happening with IFRS 17, IFRS 15 in the insurance sector, now looking at financial trace transformation broadly and, and with banking. So I'd just like to share some thoughts about banks becoming a platform um, and fundamentally change the way to do business and just share your thoughts with the audience, please, um, uh, Stuart. Yeah, sure, thanks, Mike. Um, yeah, so I think um, you know, we're seeing now with the, the challenger banks um, coming through, you know, they, they, they're really, as the, the, the fintechs are as much IT organizations as, as they are banks. Um, and I think that's very different from the way traditionally we've seen um, banks operate. And although some of the large banks that I've worked at, their IT departments thought they were IT or technology companies, but, but not normally in a, in a, in a good way. Um, traditionally, you know, banks have, uh, have grown. Yeah, and I know there's a great slide on that. Oh, sorry, sorry, Mike. I beg your pardon, I'm sure does this, and there was a slight lag in the line there. I beg your pardon. If you go to the next slide, please, um, uh, Mike. I think that supports um, uh, some of the elements you're talking about here, just the evolution of banking and clicks to create an account, and just to maybe elaborate on this slide here, please, um, Stuart. Yeah, sure. I mean, yeah, traditionally banks have uh, have, have grown through you know acquisition. Um, and as a result, the technology is very fragmented and, it, and it's you know, time consuming, to, uh, difficult to change, expensive to run. And it makes it very difficult for um, the traditional banks to shoehorn uh, banking as a platform into their infrastructure. And that's why we see so many uh, traditional banks setting up or partnering with, with the startups and, and the challenger banks. 
Um, you know, so the new breed of, the, of these banking platforms that you've got on your slide there, so the Monzo, Starlings, Revoluts, et cetera, you know, they, they have started with that sort of fabled clean sheet of paper. And by combining modern technologies, they've developed sort of fast and flexible platforms that empower the customer, um, sort of open the product distribution channels and minimize critically the, the level of intervention required on the sort of the bank side. And so as a result, you've got you know, very highly scalable platforms that facilitate multiple products, they're attractive, they're easy to use, and uh, they're very cheap to operate. Now, I know, you, you know, you, uh, banks and regulated firms uh, have tremendous challenges where there's a huge advantage with fast posts around regulation and automation. So maybe just elaborate on some of the benefit cases within banks and financial institutions of adopting fast posts. Yeah, I mean, I, I, well, I think there's benefits in, on, on both sides, both within the banks and financial institutions, but also for the consumer. So if we look at the, the, the banks first, um, through the digital platforms, through the ease of uh, client access, gathering information, the um, processing of transactions becomes very automated, very straight through and very efficient. Um, and, and, and these banks are offering products at cheaper and cheaper prices. And um, you know, to be able to do that, they have to be uh, extremely efficient internally. They can't afford rework, they can't afford manual processes. Uh, these are the things that make um, some of the traditional bank operations very, very expensive to, to run. But if you think about it from a consumer perspective, you're almost got the flip side of that. So um, historically in banking, products, yeah, yeah, uh, consumers tended to be very sticky. It was very difficult to move a, a bank account. If you had a, if you tried to move from one high street bank to another, it was something you, you, you really thought long and hard about before you even began that process. And, and you could bet it would be a, a challenging process. We're seeing today that with these digital banks that you know, there isn't really no consumer loyalty. So the banks have to um, offer great platforms and they have to offer great service and great products. Um, and you know, by doing that, they um, they'll keep uh, they'll retain their clients to the best ability they can, and they'll they'll um, you know become you know make make their organisations profitable through through that. Um, and 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 so for the consumers, that means they're getting the best of everything. They're getting you know continually uh, uh, reduced pricing from from the from the banks, better products uh, and and better offers. And I think an example of that is if you if you think about how you used to do foreign currency transactions and how expensive that was to use your credit card overseas or get cash from an ATM overseas. Now with the Monzos and the Revoluts, you know, you, you really don't even need cash and you get really, really competitive FX rates when you um, do foreign currency transactions. So I remember, you know, it's, 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 it's um, when I first entered the city in the late 80s, you know, First Direct were the disruptor. You know, they were telephone yeah. banking revolutionized customer access. And now look at here, you know, there are 120 clicks to create an account compared to Revolut 24. I mean, the, the gap is yawning, isn't it? It's huge. The um, Yeah, it's a really interesting point on, on, on banking automation and, and just a stride to ever more data. And I guess the rest of the advantage of fast posts, you know, cloud native, huge volumes of data at a very granular level. That will please not just the regulators but also the efficiency of processing. It's absolutely fabulous. Well, I think that leads me very nicely, uh, short, onto the next slide, please. And the 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 um, the third of our of our of our questions here to the panel, which if there's a particular client project or technology that you're working on now that's exciting, um, um, and what's coming down the line. And I think we're going to start with you, Stuart, and then I'm going to turn to you, Mark, and Jeremy too. So, Stuart, uh, uh, what's coming down the line that's really caught your eye? You'd like to share with the audience? Yeah, I think that the thing that's coming down the line for us, which is really exciting, is uh, US GAAP slash LDTI. Um, we're working with um, a couple of clients at the moment that uh, where we're doing IFRS 17 implementations. Um, they are uh, very interested in for their US operations, you know, a, a conversion to US GAAP uh, as well. So, so that's something for later this year that we have, you know, we've started thinking about. We're going to do some more tangible sort of steps forward on that later in the year. I think that just the other one that, uh, and it's an interesting one because it sort of actually goes backwards somewhat rather than forwards. We're looking at something at the moment for a, um, a Brexit operation where they move their um, their business offshore um, to to Europe as a result of Brexit. And um, you know, we're doing, and this is a more of a traditional, not an IFRS 17 uh, project, but it's it's more a traditional insurance processing project. 
And um, you know, so it was driven by Brexit, but we're helping them sort of uh, put that uh, their, their transfer of their legacy business over to their Brexit entity at the moment. So that's also well, a very well, that's, that's, project for us. That's quite right. I mean, the, you know, Brexit hasn't gone away, and yeah. um, you know, these are huge. Not, not only do we have the the challenges of Corona, not only do we have the challenges of the market shocks of you know, we, we've had circuit breakers in markets, we've got negative interest rates, and we've got Brexit too, and firms need to prepare themselves not too. A fantastic case study, super. I'd like to turn the same question to Mark. Mark, you know, what's coming down the line? What's eye-catching? What's exciting you'd like to share with the audience? Yeah, thanks, Mark. So, we've, yeah, we've been working quite a lot on, on what I would say, regulatory-driven uh, changes, which, as we've discussed, you know, can have great benefits. But I'm really, really excited that we're, we're, we're going to target the um, banking industry much more uh, coming up, there's a huge range of products and services that banks offer. So going beyond regulatory compliance and really looking at how we can help banks join this digital journey. So obviously a lot of investment going on in the front office, but to support that investment is needed in the back office. And we're ideally placed to um, really help banks with that. And so I'm really excited to get involved in that. Fantastic. And then Jeremy, um, uh, and I just want to remind folks to put, pop their questions into the GoToWebinar panel. We've got some great questions coming in. Jeremy, just to round off, what, lots of great stuff happening on your firm, an amazing five-year journey. What's exciting? What's coming down the line you'd like to share with us? Yeah, so um, as, as Stuart and, and um, Mark said, you know, from a a project perspective um, you know there's lots of things whether it's regulatory or, or finance transformation across sector I think we still got another good you know year and a half to two years on our FRS 17 there's a lot of firms that are still uh, you know early stage on on their journeys so that will definitely keep us busy I think the other aspect of the firm is is from a technology perspective you know so when we when we set out five years ago it was to do things differently um, you know, drive innovation. That's that's why you do startups is to do things differently and offer, mm. you know, modern solutions that allow firms to take different approaches. So we have a, a constant stream of uh, R and D within technology um, that we continue to look at. Uh, you know, new open source technologies um, help us with scalability, on demand processing. Um, which is quite exciting as well, you know, so you basically ratchet up, you don't even have to ratchet up yourself, it's it's driven by, you know, the demand of, of the data coming through, that the systems know exactly how, how much they should scale. I think when you look at sort of business as usual type technologies around workflow, uh, monitoring, machine learning, RPA, those all, you know, can factor into our solutions. Um, and then from a reporting perspective, you know, AI and advanced reporting and data analytics, data science around big data. So we have streams in all of those things. And our job is to continue to make the platform, you know, cutting edge um, as we progress over the next next 10 years. So, you know, pretty busy all round, really. Yeah. <laughs> Fantastic. No, I'm really, really, so I've really what a great chat. So I'm, we're going to hand over to Mike Richardson now, who's going to share some of the questions that have been coming in from the audience. So Mike, fire away. And if you maybe, Mike, if you actually pose a question, maybe directed to which, which panel member you, you think appropriate for the question. Yeah, so um, the first question we've had, um, it, it asked to expand on subledger technology. So I think we've mentioned subledger technology a few times in Jeremy and Mark's section. So uh, maybe I'll um, sort of start with Jeremy on this question. So if you could just expand on a sort of what that that is. I know we've sort of covered it a bit already, but also the benefits yeah. and yeah. Okay. So um, I'll, I'll, I'll sort of cover it at a high level and maybe Mark can, can talk uh, from a, a sort of a, what it brings from a user's perspective. Subledger class of technology is, you can look at it uh, in, it, it covers a number of things. So um, typically a subledger class technology will include an accounting rules engine. So you've got to get the data into the subledger in some form of debit credit. So that's an important component. And more increasingly, data needs additional calculations to be applied before you can even get ready for the, the um, the accounting aspect. So that's where the calculation engine comes in as well. 
and then sitting in front of that you've actually got the data api so it's a, it's a it's a if you talk about subledger technology and it's in its uh, as a class of technology it's it's a range of things and on the outbound you've got feeds into the general ledger and also into the reporting layer as well so it basically sits between your operational systems you know maybe your trading your settlement systems your policy administration systems and your final books and records so someone said to me the other day oh well it's a sort of financial middleware and and you can look at it like that that was a bad description but it helps you join um you know your 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 front and middle office systems to the to the final books and records without having to do the traditional point to point interfaces that you know previous generations of architectures had which weren't very transparent or not auditable and incredibly difficult to change when you had new new things so it's that sort of class technology but it's it's at this granular level as we talked about that really can drive additional business site insight and make things a lot more efficient yeah but i, I, think, add, I uh, think we've probably got if, yeah yeah if we um if you think about your general ledger you're constrained often you know you can't change the chart of accounts in the general ledger very often general ledger is linked to erp it's doing a lot of things and so the um, level of information you can hold there is also so quite difficult. So, you know, um, the way to think about it, if you want some detail or an account or a set of accounts in the general ledger, what's the best way of managing it? It becomes hugely cumbersome to do that in the general ledger. A sub ledger is, is what it says. It's another ledger. So it has all the sorts of functionality of a general ledger, but it sits outside. And that means it can be uh, hugely more detailed it can be more dynamic because it's not necessarily linked you know and if you've got a general ledger that's been in place for a long time older technology the sub ledger can run on new technology be much faster and obviously integrate with calculations as jeremy said so you know rather than build up a new server with a data warehouse or some sort of bi environment bi environment for a new you know, where you want more detail put that in your sub ledger with all the disciplines of accounting and finance that's really the key for me. Super. I think next slide, please. I've, I've, I can't believe how quickly the time has gone. Um, it's been absolutely fabulous. So I've really enjoyed the the session. So thank you all very much. Uh, so to round off, what I'd like to do uh, before we head over to the digital hangout, I would like to get one closing comment from Jeremy Mark and Short. If there's one thing you'd like the audience to take away from the today's discussion, what would that be? And I'd like to start with Stuart. Um, I think just, and, and it kind of goes back to, I think, some of the things that Mark just mentioned about subledgers, that um, the using a subledger and enforcing the rigor of accounting, so, you know, that, that whole beautiful concept of double entry is, uh, you know, it's a great way to be able to move forward and to, you know, to a large extent, disintermediate some of the existing uh, legacy infrastructure that you have. Fantastic. And same question to Mark. Yeah, I would echo that. I remember going to an IFRS 17 con conference uh, right at the start, and we were talking about policy level accounting, and, and some of the traditional accountants said to me, like, you'll never do that. You know, what I would say is, you know, look at what's happening in the front office. You know, the vision for having one version of the truth within organizations is there, and the technology is ready to do that. Lovely. And I think, uh, probably, Jeremy, some final closing comments from yourself. Okay, well, well, thank, thanks, Mike, and, and thanks, guys. Um, so yeah, you know, having having in my fourth decade, will that reach the fifth decade in technology? <laughs> we'll see. But uh, you know, but I actually, you know, keep me motivated. I think the 2020s is going to be really transformational for finance and accounting. Um, I think there is great opportunity to 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 really do what we set out many years ago, turn finance into a true added value business partner at the front end of of decisions, rather than just uh, you know at the at the back end doing doing the accounting there. So let's embrace innovation, new ideas. Let's disrupt some of the traditional way of doing things, and uh, and we can really make a difference. I absolutely love it. Fantastic. I've just so enjoyed this morning. It's been super. So, look, so again, many thanks to our panel for sharing with us their insights. To find out more about Legerity and the service provider for a copy of today's slides, 
or there's any of the topics covered today, please do get in touch at info at or visit legeriesfinancial.com. If we go to the next slide, please, we'll have some um, more details here. Great, and please do reach out to Jeremy Mark and Short. Your inbox is always open. Their LinkedIn digits are there. And if you go to the next slide, please, this session has been recorded, and a link to that video will be shared via email. And do keep an eye out for the white paper we're going to send out that Legeris you wrote with Deutsche Bank and KX and Finos. And, and if you pop to the next slide, please. We're now going to head over to diddle.tv slash MTD, um, where we're going to hang out with the guys and you can meet them up close and personal and have a chat then. And then finally, one more slide. You'll see on screen the other events we've got. Legeris here up next at 11 o'clock um, with a, a fantastic session um, on continuing their, their, their transforming finance um, with O2 and then uh, later then with Millennium Consulting. So hopefully you can catch one of those sessions too. Until then, thank you very much, guys. I really love that. I'm going to head over now. If you go to the next slide, yes, over to dinner.tv slash MTD and I'll see you there. I will continue the discussion with Jeremy, uh, with Stuart and with Mark. Guys, thank you very much, Nate. Super session. Thanks very much, Mike. Thanks. In the hangout.